Okay, but it's quite striking um, being in, just sitting there and listening to you guys, and I almost felt like I had a flashback to one of the other homeowner association meetings that I had on Nantucket. We deal with the exact same issues that you guys deal with. Most, louder, most coastal communities are dealing with all the same issues, and to be honest with you, I've never seen this many people in one group, in, in, in a room together. So you already have a leg up in terms of interested citizens um, uh, caring about these issues. So uh, we have a, uh, uh, a, a small screen here. Stop me anytime. We can have a discussion. Um, I'll move us along if, uh, if uh, the questions get a little too uh, much. But, um, and I also don't have a pointer. So. I'm just going to move us along here. Today, what I'd like to go over is uh, sort of the nutrient overloading issues. Um, you're already fairly well familiar with the nu nutrient overloading issues, but I want to just provide some sort of basis and background for why we're actually trying to deal with them and the environmental problems involved. Also, what community action um, can take place? What can a community do to take the necessary steps to actually address the and s potentially solve um, your water quality problems? Then I'd like to get directly into the process that Nantucket did for creating a Board of Health regulations and a best management practices document. And then finally, um, again, the, I want to do an overview of the best management practices. So just briefly about the Land Council. Um, we are 501c3 on the island. We were formed in 1974. We have a number of critical um, uh, programs. Um, first off, we are the island watchdog, uh, environmental watchdog. We attend all planning board hearings. Uh, conservation Commission hearings, we provide suggestions to the Board of Selectmen. We're also very luckily in that we only have one municipality on our island, not six, six on this island, yes. Um, so our watershed issues and environmental issues are somewhat contained with just one political body. But we go to um, the, board, the board, Zoning Board of Appeals, as I said, Planning Board. We also go to town meeting. We attend town meeting and we provide a voter recommendation sheet as well. Um, we also do a number of uh, research projects focusing mainly on water quality. That was one of our cores, uh, core programs, um, primarily to first look at the uh, sole source aquifer that we have. You have a sole source, designated sole source aquifer as well. And um, looking at the quantity and quality of that. And then now we've been migrating because of all uh, the land use uh, problems that we're seeing, we've been migrating into water quality of our ponds, harbors, and our estuaries. And then finally, we are also um, a open space uh, 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 agency in that we utilize conservation restrictions. Everybody familiar with a conservation restriction? Similar to a conservation easement where we either accept the donation or purchase an interest in a property. It's different than buying the fee title, but we purchase essentially the development rights um, to a property, restrict the property. A homeowner still utilizes, owns the, owns the property, but can't develop it in a certain way and it has to adhere to the terms of the conservation restriction. It's a perpetual document. It's both solidified in federal and state law, and it's recorded in the Registry of Deeds. So, so uh, a brief background. You guys basically talked about all the, all the issues already, so we can go through these quite quickly. But um, sources of, of nutrient pol pollution. Primarily, what we have here is the biggest source is uh, from the atmosphere, atmospheric deposition. And that's either direct rainfall hitting the water surface or what water rainfall hitting a impervious surface and then running off directly into the water body. Second is uh, in terms of the order of mag magnitude, um, traditionally order of magnitude um, on average, is uh, septic. Uh, we have, uh, by state law, have to have Title V septic systems. Um, if you don't and you plan to sell your property, you are going to have to upgrade it to Title V. Unfortunately, as I'm sure you know, Title V does nothing for nutrient reduction. Um, so it is somewhat just an, an unfortunately antiquated law now. Um, we've already, we, the state changed their Title V requirement to improve them to Title V requirements in the 80s and early 90s. And unfortunately, it's already antiquated because Title V does not work for coastal municipalities. And then finally, fertilizer. And that's what I, the heart of what I would like to talk today. Um, going, can you just jump back? See if we can uh, jump back here to this one. Actually, yeah. So um, just a quick primer, um, residential runoff through septic and roads. You have agriculture and livestock runoff. There are a couple of farms um, on Nantucket. 
It's not that big of an issue. There's a number of farms on Martha's Vineyard, as I'm sure you know, that do have a potential um, effect on down gradient water resources. Essentially, the excess nitrogen and phosphorus, depending on if you're in a freshwater or saltwater body, um, that exacerbates um, certain uh, aquatic life uh, growth. Uh, you'll see algae blooms, you'll see uh, loss of light penetration going down to eelgrass beds, death of eelgrass beds, as Jim was saying, anoxic conditions and death of shellfish beds and whatnot. Really a, a, a situation that Martha's Vineyard is seeing, Nantucket's seeing, the whole world is seeing in terms of down gradient water bodies. Go ahead. Okay, and then also uh, our soils. Um, Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard have similar soils, very, very sandy, low in organic matter, and are very prone to nutrient leaching. If you go out into the Berkshires where there's a fairly healthy um, uh, mix of clays uh, uh, versus the, the, the sands, you really have the ability to retain some of the nutrients a little bit better than you do have these, these sandy coastal outwash soils. Um, on Nantucket, again, our, um, our soils are mostly all sand. I imagine with the vegetation that I'm seeing here, there is some, some amount of clay in the soil as, w as well. Um, in the northern portion, the glacial um, moraine of Nantucket, probably similar to here, um, you get about six to eight feet under the sand, you have an impermeable barrier of clay. And what happens in the northern part is that the nutrients filter in um, through the clay, hit the impermeable barrier, and then straight off to the water body. For the southern portions in our outwash plain, it's just pure sand, and that goes down and leaches to the water bodies and potentially our aquifer as well. Water quality um, issues in Ma Massachusetts. Again, this is a, a statewide problem, nationwide problem, worldwide problem. Um, we have a documented in increase of uh, nutrients in our embayments and fr freshwater bodies. Well, why is, this, uh, why is this an issue not just for um, our concern in terms of an ecological impact? Well, there's actually water quality compliance issues, and this is probably why it's really being brought into the forefront more, because we now have to comply. Um, we've always had to comply with the Federal Clean Water Act since 72, but now the state is actually taking some um, steps towards municipalities um, adhering to these Clean Water Acts, and that's why we've been doing um, the Massachusetts estuaries reports throughout our coastal um, municipalities. Remediation efforts have targeted septic systems, expansion of sewer, we'll talk a little bit about that, and stormwater for infrastructure. Most recently, we've been discussing fertilizer, and again, that's what I'm going to be talking to you today. So how does a responsible community take ac action? I didn't know if responsible was the right, right word. It could be caring community. It could be um, a community that's forced to take action from state representatives, um, regulators. There's a number of ways that we can um, take action, but the best, uh, best step, first step, is actually doing research on your water body. We have potentially anecdotal evidence that there is algae blooms, there is this, there is that. There's loss of shellfish beds. You need to have qualified scientific research um, on your water body. And you guys have, are, are miles ahead of other communities as well in terms of the water quality work that you've been doing. And also you have a draft, um, you're not gonna be able to see it, but this is the cover of your draft Lagoon Pond Massachusetts Estuaries Report. It was a, you had a draft that was voted in um, in September of 2012. And this is the, probably in the report, this is the most important slide of the whole report. Um, essentially, you can't even read it, but um, um, total what they say is that 46% of your nutrient inputs is the sediments itself, which is very interesting. So you have in a lot of internal loading going on um, with your sediments that are in the pond. Atmospheric deposition and septic um, are the, uh, septic I believe is this one and you have a fertilizer load, which appears in terms of this totality, fairly minute. But if you get into the controllable sources, this is right, right here, your controllable sources is septic, three-fourths that we can control, depending on if you want to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to sewer. You have approximately 15% controllable for agriculture and fertilizer. It might not seem that much, but if you're trying to hit a threshold, which this draft uh, estuaries project uh, uh, has put out. It basically issues a total maximum daily load for your water body for nitrogen. And you have to get below that. That's, that's the number we're shooting for. And when you guys were talking about different issues that you want to address, such as uh, uh, increased shellfishing, dredging, um, 
fertilizer regulations, expansion of sewer. This, along with your uh, comprehensive wastewater management plan that Jim was saying, that's your bread and butter. That's where you have to basically start because the DEP and the municipality have signed into an agreement that this is going to be your, your, guide, your guideline. This is going to be the way, you, way you're going to go forward. What I believe the sediments here are representing is that you have um, years upon years upon years of aquatic growth and dieback and uh, decomposition that have built up. And the more, you ha the more nitrogen um, that you have in the system, the more accelerated this algae growth or vegetative growth um, takes hold. And then that decomposes and goes back into the, um, the bottom layer of the, uh, the uh, ecosystem. The nitrogen and nutrients are still there. They might all be a little breaking down, broken down, but the nitrogen is still there and it increases the internal loading. So the next amount of next year's growth um, will utilize the nitrogen in that decomposition. Next way, education. This is a great, this is one of the best things that I've, we actually are gonna be doing a blue pages ourselves. Um, this is, so you have your research, you have a documented increase, you have documented science-based information um, about your problems, and let me just step back. Your comprehensive wastewater management plan and your, um, your uh, coastal estuaries report, you're gonna have to have certain ideas, such as I, I explained, and present those to the municipality and to the state, but it's gotta fall within the computer modeling that is being done to hit this total maximum daily load. So after you have your coastal management plan and you have an idea of where your septics are, um, your sewer is, uh, dredging, what sort of dredging you want to do, the computer models, modelers are going to throw that in. Okay, we're going to expand sewers to about here. We're going to do alternative innovative sewers to the north, denitrifying uh, septic, not alternative innovative septics, and denitrifying septics to the north. And we're going to dredge a channel. They're going to plug that into their com computer-based model, and they're going to come up with a, a TMDL to see if, uh, they're going to come up with their nitrogen load to see if it gets below or above your TMDL. So as you come up with all these ideas that you're saying, there's actually a framework that you can use these ideas in terms of really hitting this TMDL. And this is your um, uh, lagoon pond watershed. And it's very interesting in that it goes up to the highest point here and go goes from east, uh, west to east and then uh, south to north. But what is interesting for me to, uh, is that you have three municipalities. And that's very difficult in terms of getting to the solution um, using your options, particularly as it relates to sewering. However, if you do have uh, multiple municipalities that are interested in all on board, there's a way to, to, to get there. We have done the same thing. Um, we have identified all of our watersheds. Again, you're not probably gonna be able to see this photo, but this is our main Nantucket Harbor watershed and our Mattaquet Harbor watershed. These are the two important ones as it relates to our shell fishing, our scalloping industries and our harbors, and then you have some fresh water, freshwater coastal bay pond um, uh, uh, watersheds as well. And we've actually taken those water, uh, watersheds and made them protection districts. So I don't know if you've done that here in terms of the Marsa Vineyard actually having um, protection districts throughout the municipalities, but one thing that we've done is that we actually have in, the, in our Board of Health regulations, separate from the fertilizer regulations I'm gonna go into, we have a watershed protection district. This was to do an inspection program for all the septic systems within this protection district to make sure that they were compliant with Title V. It, is, it was helpful in terms of identifying the cesspools and the very inadequate uh, septic systems. Um, it got most of them, if not all of them, up to Title V. Again, it needs to go a little bit above and beyond and come up with some other um, options besides the Title V, as I said. What I have been doing with uh, certain homeowner associations on Nantucket and a little bit beyond, but mostly on Nantucket, is in terms of education, what's the relationship, what's people's relationship with the water body? Well, I, I, just sitting here, I can tell that you all have a personal relationship. You have a recreational relationship. You might have a historical re relationship. You've been here for so, so long. You also have a relationship with just the recreational activities. You guys have been talking about shell fishing and your uh, propagation facility throughout this meeting uh, as I was sitting there, and that is an ideal community symbol to latch onto. We have eelgrass and scallops. That is our, again, bread and butter. 
for people getting involved. We have one of the most viable, if not the most viable, scallop industries in the Northeast for bay scallops. We have about 40 to 50 at the beginning of the season commercial scallopers that go out um, and make um, their livelihood from uh, October to the end of March. So we'd like to promote that in terms of our educational materials, in terms of how important it is to the commercial um, aspects of Nantucket, um, the social aspects of Nantucket, and then also the environmental aspects of Nantucket. So we show fancy photos of the eel grass and the scallops, and then we show these after the, land, the fertilizing photo. We show those, those photos. That's a Lingbia invasive algae that has been found to start smothering our eelgrass um, populations, which is really causing quite a problem. Codium species and some other um, algae species and seaweed species have been doing some smothering as well, but this is one of the worst that we've seen. Not sure if you can see this, but this is not Nantucket, but this used to be an eelgrass bed um, and was completely smothered with this Lingbia species. Similar to what you guys are probably experiencing with some of the algae that you're seeing, um, the floating algae and then some of the, the cyanobacteria in terms of the algae blooms as well. Uh, just a plug for land conservation in terms of education as well. Again, these are tools that we have. You have research, you have education. Within the education, the importance of land conservation. Almost 45% of our island is protected. And if I overlaid that watershed here, you'd see that a lot of it is in green in terms of protection. If you overlaid, over, overlaid an open space um, layer on top of your watershed uh, 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 delineation, what would you see? Well, luckily, what I see around here is actually a lot of nat native vegetation incorporated in d a developed area. Um, you have a fabulous uh, parcel right here that's protected with all nat native vegetation. Um, in a Google map I saw, you had a number of subdivisions going up um, uh, that way. I, can't, I think it's that way is where I saw them. And so the importance of land conservation, that's where you can start. It costs money, we all know that, but in terms of getting reducing nutrient inputs, this is where we start. If you can't do that, we have to go solve it some other way. So for Nantucket, getting into the fertilizers. What happens when we have a gorgeous landscape like this? Um, our landscape is primarily heath sand plains with scrub oak. We don't have these gorgeous trees that you guys have, <laughs> which I love. Um, but it is still a spectacular landscape in itself. This is an area that we recently protected that was abutting the north head of uh, Long Pond, which feeds into Mattaquet Harbor. What if that turns into this? And again, I'm not sure if you can see this, but this is a fully developed neighborhood with um, a gigantic uh, lawn for each area and perennial beds. Obviously heavy maintained, heavily maintained, and probably irrigated out the wazoo and probably has a lot of fer fertilizer as well. Go ahead. And then what about this? If this was a full-blown, this is one of the most beautiful um, sand plain grasslands that we have on the island. But if, what if it turns from this into this? And this is an actually an organically maintained lawn, an organically maintained perennial bed, but still has the exact same potential for nutrient leaching as a chemical synthetic maintained lawn and, and perennial bed, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Again, in a little side garden. The thing about Nantucket is that we have, per capita, the most landscapers in Massachusetts. I, <laughs> we sent out that best management. We have been working with the town. We sent out this best management practices document with the town, and the town found 150 people to send this to. 150 people, land, 150 landscaping companies to send it to. Um, obviously, those were probably redundant, so I'd cut down a third, but you're talking about 100 landscapings, landscaping companies on the island. In that watershed alone, that watershed I showed you in Nantucket Harbor, um, I would say 90 to 95, probably 95% of those properties are professionally maintained by landscapers. So the amount of fertilizer that is going into our system is, is staggering. You guys just driving around are fairly lucky in that, again, a lot of native vegetation is incorporated into your landscape. You have a respect for the native landscape and the aesthetic uh, landscape. Uh, but there are pockets, as I drove around and looked, on, looked at some other, there's some pockets of landscaping areas that, that definitely affect the, the pond as well. Okay, so let's get into um, regulation. We talked about research, we talked about education. Well, we have the research as a base, we have the education as basically the all-encompassing information dispersal that we'd like to do to get everybody to know the problem. 
what if people don't act? What if people don't do anything? What if people don't pump their, sept their septic systems three to five years? What if they don't want to do an innovative alternative septic system or a denitrifying system? What if people don't want to stop fertilizer use? Well, unfortunately, and in my, in my business, I say fortunately, we have regulations. And regulations um, can cover expansion of sewers. It's obviously a capital cost and, and um, hurts people's wallets, but that potentially has to happen. Um, and one other thing that we've been doing is looking at fertilizers. So getting into the heart of today, fertilizers. Um, Fertilizers have always been talked about on Nantucket, again, because of this outrageous ornamental landscaping industry and ornamental landscaping um, uh, development that's going on the island. So there's been discussions, whether it's at the selectmen or um, through planning board, zoning, town meeting, to either outlaw fertilizers completely, um, outlaw fertilizers in certain watersheds, uh, minimize fertilizer use. There's always been this discussion. And unfortunately, up until now, up until 2010, we always butted heads with either um, developers or landscapers or the um, individuals that actually home, own the home. So what happened at the town meeting uh, two years ago is that there was a huge shift in the perception because of our research that we did with the West Series project to actually start looking at fertilizers and to potentially ban fertilizers. There's an article brought to town meeting. That meeting, that article got, I wouldn't say tabled, but it got sent to um, a committee which was formed, an Article 68 work group. And the charge of that committee was to develop a comprehensive plan to reduce the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus from fertilizers in our harbors and to develop an implementation plan budget and time frame. As we worked, we expanded this charge from um, harbors to ponds, estuaries, and the open ocean as well. The committee members, this is, was, if you do want to embark on something like this, and again, this was, um, this was easier because we had one municipality, um, but that's just something that you guys are going to have to deal with. Uh, it has to be all-inclusive, and maybe it won't be so controversial here because the landscaping industry might not has, of, has, have as powerful of a force as it does on Nantucket, but we made it all-inclusive from nonprofits to the Conservation Commission, landscape professionals, golf course managers. In my opinion um, and in my experience, the golf course managers are actually the most intelligent people in terms of nitrogen reduction and phosphorus reduction. Um, they went to school for it, they, um, they know about landscaping, they're fully versed in it. If they care, then you can get a step with them. If they don't care, then it's another, another ball game. Fishermen, obviously, concerned citizens, and then my favorite politicians. And I'm going to end the talk later talking about politicians. Who's a politician in this room? The Board of Selectmen didn't come. You're, you're a politician. You're a good politician, though, I think. One other person, no, one other group that we brought in, um, which is very important, is um, scientists. We needed a science-based regulations that was not based upon gut and emotion, but it was science-based regulations. Um, we had uh, experts from University of Connecticut, Cornell, and UMass. Um, so that was very important to have, particularly as we worked with the landscaping industry, because if they just perceive it as a gut reaction from environmental radical, radicals, they don't necessarily buy into it. But if the scientists are at the meeting basically saying this has to be done to reduce, to improve your water quality, they start to listen. In the end, we had committee recommendations. Um, we had new Board of Health regulations, which um, essentially limited the type, quantity, and timing, and we made it island-wide. We were originally just going to focus potentially on the harbors um, through our experience in terms of the latest science on phosphorus, which we haven't really been talking about, um, and its effect on freshwater bodies, and even not just freshwater bodies, but s exacerbating uh, situations in brackish and saltwater bodies that you really have to look at, at island-wide as well. Um, we came up with the creation of a best management practices document, and then uh, we recommended educational initiatives, training for homeowners and landscape professionals, and that's where it all is. Um, I can provide you with a link f in the future if you guys, wh whoever wants to work on this, we definitely should work hand in hand or I can provide you guys with any, any of the stuff that we've had. 
So essentially, this was what it was. Um, no fertilizer. These are the core standards for the regulations. And I have a pamphlet here, too, that we produced um, with the town. We put the town seal on it, pretending like it was done by the town, but the town didn't do it. <laughs> the land council did it. Um, but this has the core regulations right there. The reason why I make that little joke is that we really want the town to follow through on implementation so it doesn't come across as an environmental um, initiative from an environmental group. It's got to be all inclusive from everybody and if you have the leadership of your town, it goes a lot farther than, again, a so-called environmental radical group um, doing it. We've been labeled that many times. <laughs> Core standards, no fertilizer application between certain dates because essentially the plants aren't growing. And if you put fertilizer down, nitrogen down, and a plant's not utilizing or uptaking that nitrogen, there's a greater possibility that it leaches out into the groundwater. Uh, no phosphorus unless a soil test indicates a deficiency, and this is very important um, for, the, for uh, more, more so for um, in, uh, uh, areas that have freshwater ponds. Phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in fresh, on average, phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in freshwater bodies. If you increase phosphorus in a freshwater body, that causes excessive problems. Nitrogen is the limiting nutrient, again, on average, in saltwater bodies. And if you increase nitrogen in a saltwater body, that causes excessive growth problems as well. Um, a soil test, I'm going to get into just a little bit about a soil test, but in terms of phosphorus, you cannot put a single drop of phosphorus unless it's in the form of compost and establishment of a lawn, um, unless you, your soil test indicates a deficiency. No more than a total of three pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet per year. This is actually um, was a compromise. I think people can go a lot lower than this um, in their um, regulations. And then this is actually almost as important, if not more important than this, total three pounds. No more than 0.25 pounds of quick-release nitrogen per 1,000 square feet of app, uh, per application, and no more than 0.5 pounds total per application. This might confuse everybody, but um, this is what it is. You have to know what you're putting on your lawn. You have to know how big your lawn is in terms of um, uh, its total square feet, and you have to know how many pounds of nitrogen you're putting in. In the BMP, there's, I'm not going to go into it now, but in the BMP, there's a clear, concise way to, for you to determine um, what you're putting on. And then inspect and monitor between applications. Go ahead. Uh, the standards for commercial applicators, this is the other thing. And again, I'm not sure exactly how big your industry is, but ours is huge um, and somewhat unregulated. All commercial applicators must receive a license from the Board of Health. So there's a licensing program for Nantucket and that there is going to be the creation of, the town has not done it yet, one of my beasts with the town, they have to create a licensing program. Um, how that license is going to be administered, we're not fairly sure whether it's you have to take uh, a workshop, um, you have to do a test. Essentially, the way the regulation is written is that they have to show proficiency with the best management practices document. And then enforcement, which is probably one of the most difficult things to enforce, um, anywhere. Um, how I'm going to know what Mr. Jones is doing down Shimmel Pond Road at the end of the road is next to impossible. However, you need an enforcement angle. If there is an enforcement, um, even if it's not going to be enforced, if there's not an enforcement thing in there, people will just say, ah, it's, it's a non-binding resolution. It doesn't mind, mean anything. So you do need an enforcement angle. And I think there are certain ways that if you have a self-policing landscaping industry or self-policing community, if somebody is takes out a bag of fertilizer and it has phosphorus in it, and you can easily see from the numbers, I'll get into that, and are bringing in into their, into their <laughs> uh, garden, you can easily call up your enforcement division. I mean, that's what's going to happen on Nantucket. It's not going to be very uh, good in terms of creating good neighbors, but that's what we have to do. Here's the document itself. I'm going to go through it just a little bit. So again, if you want to um, go down this path, this is a good um, way to go in that it's not just regulations, but you actually have a um, best management practices manual that you can use as your guideline and as your template. The objectives of the BMP, and just go, go through these. We've really been talking about this stuff already. It's essentially to protect the waters, um, the down gradient waters, and reducing um, fertilizers, not just through types and quantities, but certain cultural practices as well, mowing heights, um, um, doing other things that I'm going to get into in just a little bit. 
And then again, science-based. It has to be a science-based document. So the sections itself. Um, first section, site assessment. So imagine if your town, which I hope they would never, never do, um, wanted to sell, sell off half of the, uh, the camp here, or um, whatever. Uh, what's this called again? Sailing camp. Sailing camp and sold it to a big developer. Well, you have an amazing amount of native vegetation, which um, uptakes a good amount of nitrogen through atmospheric that's going on the ground through atmospheric de deposition. So if you have a site assessment for new construction, I think what people should do, this is sort of a no-brainer. You go out, you want to preserve as much um, new uh, native vegetation as, as possible. You also want to identify your site conditions. Where's the south-facing slopes? Where's the wetter soils? Um, where's the wind coming from in terms of the northeast? Um, don't plant a plant where it's not supposed to be, essentially. Site planning for existing landscapes, um, for pretty much the similar um, to that. And then choosing a management plan. This is, this is basically the, the basis. And um, how many people, it might not be that much, how many people have their gardens professionally maintained here? So three or four. If I was in Nantucket, everybody would raise their hand. So this is more of a document for you to use in your own landscaping. If you do have landscaping, but also a document for you to pass on to other people as well. Choosing a management plan, if they have a professional landscaper that they work with, one of the best things to do, besides just figuring out how much they cost, is say, look, I want my lawn and garden maintained according to these principles. And so there you have a clear conscious understanding with your landscaper that they are going to manage your property with respect to the environment and with respect to the water body, the lagoon that you're working with. Soil nutrients and soil test is our second section. Very important to understand the soil and how it works. I'm not going to go into soil today. I could talk about soil if I was fully educated about soil for three, four weeks or a whole semester, which was one of the classes in university that I did. But essentially, it consists of mineral particles, sand, silt, and clay, and organic matter derived from plant um, and animal matter. Um, why test your soil? Anybody know why you would test your soil before you fertilized? So you know what's there. Know what's there. So you know if you actually need to fertilize. Um, landscaping industry is starting to change a little, but landscaping industry went into the four-step Scotts program. Basically, who cares what the soil has, if it has leftover nutrients that the plants can use? We're going to do the four steps, um, fertilize four times a year, and it doesn't matter what the soil has, this is what we're going to do. And the importance of testing your soil is you can basically tell how much phosphorus you have, you can tell what your organic matter has, you can tell somewhat potentially through the soil test what you should be utilizing for nitrogen. If I went to um, my soil test and I saw that, um, you can do the next one. Uh, and go ahead. This is a soil test here, but you're not going to be able to read it. Essentially, it has low to very high. Phosphorus here is very, very high. If I read my soil test, I'm not going to be applying phosphorus based upon this soil test. But if you didn't do a soil test, traditional knowledge is, oh, you want flowering plants. Phosphorus very helps um, the bloom of plants um, on average. And so I'm going to put phosphorus down. Well, that's not always the best thing to do, particularly when you have a science, again, a science-based document analysis of your soil to determine what your plants need and your soil needs. Uh, a real basic primer on fertilizer types and, uh, and sources. Um, your three main nutrients in fertilizer is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and essentially that makes up the percentage NPK ratio, those three numbers that you see on a fertilizer bag. Um, nitrogen comes in two forms, slow release, um, which is uh, water insoluble or a coated slow release. Essentially the water soluble, I'll just flip it around, the water soluble nitrogen comes in two forms, nitrate and ammonium, and those are easily readily uptaken by plants. Um, water insoluble comes in two different forms, um, water insoluble nitrogen um, is your typical organic um, matter that has nitrogen in it that has to be broken down through a process called mineralization. Essentially, microorganisms have to eat it and poop it, and then the plants can use it. There are slow-release synthetic versions of um, water insoluble in that they have a polymer coating on the fertilizer. So if you have a chemical polymer coated uh, pellet of fertilizer that you put out in April, it's slow-release, and it's supposed to be 
um, utilized throughout the season. Excuse me. Yes. Is that, what do you recommend, a slow release? Personally, personally I recommend um, uh, either or as long as you're meeting the requirements um, of the BMP. I, with quick release, it's, it's a lot easier to cause a problem because it's basically much more readily leachable. Um, it, slow release, it has to get broken down through mineralization. But people, oh, and I, I, I'm one at fault. I have a background in organic agriculture and worked at, on organic farms all over the place from Hawaii to Oregon to Vermont and was thinking, oh, as long as it's organic, it's fine. As long as it's slow release, it's fine. Well. Um, if you have a plant that you utilize slow release nitrogen on and the plant uptakes that and there's still some nitrogen left in that fertilizer that you've, that, that, that you've used but the plant doesn't need any more, it's still going to go through a process of mineralization and then it's still going to be readily available to go down into the leaching. So if you use fa fast release, you have to be very careful in your quantities and timing and application. If you lose slow release, you have to be careful in terms of how much. You can't use repeated applications of slow release. I much would rather prefer slow release organics just because of all the other benefits, so that's what I would, I would do. And there's the section on fertilizer types in the BMP explains it much better than I just did. <laughs> um, again, phosphorus can now, uh, can now, phosphorus can become mobile in the soil. Uh, science up to about the mid-80s was that phosphorus is really bound in the soil and is not very mobile. Well, the science in the past 90s and uh, 2000 beyond really showed us that um, sufficient phosphorus and excessive phosphorus applications cause phosphorus leaching into the groundwater. And that's why you're seeing communities and states like New Jersey, Florida, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, passing acts basically banning phosphorus um, from being sold in the state. Go ahead. And then again, over application of either organic or synthetic will lead to nutrient leaching. The role of compost. We've always thought that the role of compost is a great thing. Well, primarily it is. It's an amazing um, source for organic matter, um, a food source for beneficial uh, fungi and bacteria. And again, there's so many other things with, with compost, which is great. It improves uh, uh, soil moisture and, um, uh, and nutrient retention, which is very important. But it's very important to note and understand where your compost come from. Most of the compost that is uh, sold um, through a municipality uh, composting operation is just leaf and yard waste. Fairly low nitrogen and phosphorus numbers. But if you have a poultry-based um, uh, compost, the nitrogen and the phosphorus is fairly excessive. Not excessive, it's fairly high. So you, if you're putting compost down and you're thinking that's just a soil amendment, it's not, it's a soil fertilizer. This is a, a table um, which essentially is in the, um, in the BMP but explains um, the potential impacts of applying too much compost. On Nantucket um, and through certain um, organic agencies, there was a promotion of utilizing compost on your lawn, essentially spreading compost throughout your entire lawn to top dress it, and that would provide sufficient nutrients for your, for your property. Yes, it does. It also provides sufficient other um, beneficial bacteria and fungi as well. But if you utilized a animal-based, manure-based um, uh, compost, applied it at a depth of two inches throughout your entire lawn, the pounds of phosphate per applied per 1,000 square feet for two inches, 124 pounds of phosphorus. Where our our basically our standard is we want to go below six. So 124 pounds of phosphorus. If I showed the nitrogen um, uh, version of this for compost as well, um, very startling as well. So if you're applying compost around your gardens, your perennials, your hedges, and you're doing it year after year after year, it's a slow release fertilizer. If you're doing it year after year after year, and at some point, you're going to be actually applying too much nitrogen than the plant needs, and it will leach into the groundwater. What about home compost? Home compost. Um, again, that would probably be on the last slide more along the lines of, of leaf and yard waste. Not a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus in that. That's an appropriate use uh, of a product. What we're also recommending in the BMP is that if for professional landscapers, look, if it's just you and me he's doing something here and there, it's not that big of a deal. But for professional landscapers that are using large, massive quantities of compost as a soil amendment, 
um, they should know what the MPK ratio of that compost is. Um, if you leave your long clippings on um, throughout the whole year, that is um, on average about a pound of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet. So when you're incorporating it into your three pounds, um, you've basically put a pound of nitrogen onto your property. It's a great utilization of recycling the nitrogen that's in, in that. I, I do it un unless I have a big gathering at my house the day I have to mow because then everybody's walking in with grass clippings on their feet. So there's sort of some, some of that issue. But on average, I always uh, utilize uh, my grass clippings. It's a great source of nitrogen. About one pound per thousand square feet is what they do. But if you're going to be putting three pounds of fertilizer on, you've now uh, gone to four pounds and you're over your limit. So you have to take that into consideration. Okay, so no more than three pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. This is the key thing, a spoon feeding concept. Low, low amounts of fertilizer, low, low amounts of nitrogen, multiple fertilizer applications. It's an industry, it's a business um, <coughs> change. Basically, it changes people's um, mindset where I can do a weed and feed application and I'm done for the year of three pounds or five pounds or six pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet. But the golf courses, they do it great. They have foliar applications. Foliar applications is probably one of the best ways of lawn grass uptake for nitrogen because you have, um, if you have a dense, dense uh, turf surface, it's really the foliar application. It doesn't necessarily go into the soil itself where it's prone to leaching. And they do it in very small, small amounts. So I have a friend at his golf course, the Nantucket golf course, he goes out and he sprays um, one tenth of a pound one week, looks at it for a week, sprays a quarter pound, sprays a little here, a little there. The problem with the golf courses and transferring golf course practices to a typical homeowner or a typical sort of property amongst 80 properties that this landscaper has is very difficult because they're there day after day after day after day after day checking out the situation and can do these spoon feedings. It's very difficult for that to be transferred over to a large scale landscaping industry, but it has to happen. And that's the key, it has to happen, particularly for Nantucket with our, with our, our ornamental landscapes. We have sample management plans in there, uh, organic management plans, synthetic management plans, and a combination management plan. Um, and then there's a whole section on guidelines for establishment and renovation of tur turf grass. Turf care cultural practices. Um, these are very important because they reduce the need for fertilizer. It keeps the plants he healthy, uh, the plants, the turf healthy. And then um, we do have a section on nutrient management of gardens, trees, and shrubs. And this might be more in tune with some of the stuff that you guys are doing as well. And that um, the same standards apply for perennial gardens and annual gardens. Um, you need to do a soil test. On average, you could be doing your soil test once every two to three years um, to really determine what you have out there. And we have a lower amount of uh, threshold for pounds of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet. It's two pounds uh, per 1,000 square feet per year. And one of the reasons why is that if you have a perennial garden, there's definitely pockets of areas where there's no roots growing. There's potentially no roots growing. You, if, with a turf system, you have a very, if it's healthy, a very dense, dense root mass that allows better uptake of nutrients. If, in a perennial garden, you don't necessarily have that. And to be frank with you, to be honest with you, um, my gardens at my house, I compost with my own internal recycling of, of, clip, of uh, vegetable waste and uh, yard waste. I've fertilized them at a low, low amount once every three, four years, and they do fine. They do absolutely fine. Fertilizing perennial gardens is sometimes a little excessive. And again, that's my opinion, so I'm throwing in an anecdotal thing of an opinion. Um, and this is science-based in terms of a two pounds. This is the number we got from our, from our researchers. But it's always good to have anecdotal stuff from a speaker to tell you. <laughs> native plants, who had the native plant question? Okay, butterfly weed. Gorgeous, doesn't need any fertilizer. Hudsonia tomentosa, it's a heath plant. It would be more um, in tune with your, in the south of the island for you guys, coastal outwash plain. And then this is one of my favorite shrubs, beach plum. Gorgeous. You could go throughout Nantucket in terms of um, um, native plants that are very beautiful in the landscape. I actually prefer these. these the, the, the white, black, and red oaks that you guys have here are absolutely fantastic with the huckleberry understory. Um, it's gorgeous, and they don't need any fertilizer. 
Uh, role of irrigation. Luckily, when I was driving back and forth, I really didn't see a lot of irrigated lawns. You can tell irrigated lawns, this, well, this is an odd year, so much rain. But um, in Oak Bluffs, I could tell which lawns were irrigated and which lawns weren't um, downtown Oak Bluffs because the ones that aren't dense green aren't irrigated. Um, irrigation is very, very critical, irrigation management, when it comes to nutrient leaching, um, particularly with the nutrients that are water soluble. Um, this is just a, a, a list of things when it comes to irrigation. Um, the three irrigation companies are by far some of the richest companies on the on Nantucket right now. Almost every property in that watershed district is irrigated too. It's quite an industry on Nantucket. Go ahead. Implementation. Okay, so assuming you guys do this, um, uh, multi-municipality that you do this, education outreach when it's implemented. You have your rules and regulations set, either you do a bylaw or you do Board of Health regulations or you do it through other, some other ordinance uh, mechanism. You have that set and you have a best management practices document that is more sort of in tune to Martha's Vineyard, but I imagine it's going to be fairly similar if you guys do have that. Education outreach is one of the most important things. Constantly speaking with landscaping professionals, constantly speaking with homeowners, and then retail is critical. We have three main retail places on island. Um, municipalities can't regulate what is sold at a retail. It's state law. So if we wanted to limit phosphorus being sold or nitrogen being sold or, or synthetic fertilizer being sold, we couldn't do that in our local municipality. The state deals with that. So you have to go to the retail people and say, look, this is our regulation. This is the importance. This is how it affects our ecosystem. And you know what a lot of them will say? You tell me to buy. You, whatever you tell me to buy, I'll buy it as long as the landscapers and homeowners are going to buy it. They don't care what they're, as long as it's sold, they'll, 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 that's what they'll, as long as it's um, bought, that's what they're going to sell. So again, it's a lot of discussion. Licensing, we don't have a licensing um, program. Depending on what your landscape industry is, you may or may not need a licensing program. Our, again, our landscaping industry is gigantic, um, so we need a licensing program. We also have a lot of um, individuals that are not um, connected with the island whatsoever in terms of a relationship. So they're what called they're fly-by-night landscapers, um, fly-by-night landscapers that just come in and then they'll do whatever. They'll undercut everybody else. So there is a need for a licensing program. If if our board of health enforcement person is walking around downtown and they see, some, they see a landscaper that's fertilizing, they should be able to go up to that person and say, do you have your license? Similar to a pesticide applicator's license. And then government follow through. Um, I've been talking, I'm sorry, I've been talking a little long, but I've been talking all about all this stuff and um, I didn't really get into the government follow through. We have, even though it's a little easier than you guys, a government that just is not following through on this stuff right now. We have no li licensing program in place. I don't know if it's gonna be ever put into place. You need um, municipal expenditures to do that. Maybe a new staff position, maybe a, a part-time position to do that. You need enforcement oversight as well. You need additional money. So you need support from your government. And so it's not just a nonprofit going around spouting off uh, all this stuff uh, about environmental issues. You need a town basically taking the lead on their own regulations. It took me four or five months, and I'm, I can do this because nobody has a relationship with Nantucket here. It's great. I can talk all bad about my... <laughs> um, the Board of Health voted in August of last year to uh, adopt the uh, regulations and the Best Management Practice man Manual. The regulations went into effect January 1st. There was no licensing program in place. That was potentially expected. Um, if the licensing program isn't in place, homeowners and landscapers have to adhere to the best management practices document. So there's no licensing program in place, but they have to adhere to this. They didn't mail this out until April. The, the town on their own regulations. So you need a dedicated town board, however it's structured, board of selectmen um, and department heads that are really going to follow through on this and get this educational document out. You can have, if, as long as your education is set and landscapers know about this, that's where the enforcement can potentially take place. But you can't basically enforce somebody on nutrient and nitrogen reduction fertilizer regulations if they don't even know they exist. So government follow through is, is key. 
And any more questions? That's about it.